Vaccination. It's the most successful weapon in our fight against infectious diseases and has even eradicated one of the deadliest of them to come about in human history. It is a weapon with flaws, however, or perhaps I should say criteria. For it to ever work, we need people, and not just some people, but a lot of people, to get over this big, scary hurdle we have been hearing a whole lot of lately. Vaccine hesitancy. We have a tendency to dismiss vaccine hesitancy as this two-dimensional issue that occurs as a result of poor health education. The reality, however, is that it is a symptom of more complex issues that underlie our global healthcare systems and how we think about them. To explore what these might be, let's take a look at the polio program in Pakistan. Today, the tragedy of paralytic polio can be prevented in individuals protected by all three recommended doses of polio vaccine. Well, this eradication campaign goes back to 1987. and the first years, we made immense progress. And now we've got some countries that are tough. Even if one country is harboring a virus, the, the disease is not eliminated. <laughs> Poliomyelitis is a debilitating infectious disease that mainly affects children under the age of five and has no known cure. It carries a significant risk of irreversible paralysis. Sometimes this will even affect the breathing muscles, which is why you'll often see pictures of these terrifying iron lungs associated with the disease. Thanks to the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, we have seen this disease reduced to levels of extreme rarity. Only two endemic countries remain, Pakistan and Afghanistan. The problem with eradicating infectious diseases is that until the point that there's complete eradication, you've still got a huge battle on your hands. The longer the polio virus persists, the greater the chances it can mutate and spread. The basic reproduction number for polio virus, which essentially means how many people each infected person will pass the virus on to, is 4. For point of reference, the novel coronavirus has an R0 of 2. The difference between how many people become sick at first may seem negligible, but as the rounds of infection increase, we see that polio's transmissibility is exponentially worse than COVID-19. Bottom line, those few dozen remaining cases still carry the potential of devastating future outbreaks. In 2018, the Independent Monitoring Board of the Global Polio Eradication Initiative said that there has been no significant progress in recent years for Pakistan's polio program. The report highlights a number of hurdles to the program's success, which include difficult to navigate terrain separating vaccinators from populations, poor sanitation resulting in reservoirs for the virus, severe deprivation in basic health services, and mistrust and hostility towards the program from parents. Problems like these are found often in economically deprived countries like Pakistan. Without the government investing in infrastructure, like roads or hospitals, the ability to deliver health interventions and improve quality of life is severely limited. Consequently, these deprived communities are wary when that same government knocks on their door to offer protection against a disease that they see no sign of in their children. Alternative explanations for these visits which fits a worldview that governments and international bodies only serve their own hidden agendas, are favored. These kinds of messages are popularized over social media by anti-state groups like Tariqa Taliban and feed off fears from events like the Abbottabad incident. The Pakistani Taliban increased its attacks on polio workers after the US tracked down and killed Osama bin Laden in 2011. It's claimed that the CIA was helped by a local doctor, Shaquille Afridi, who used the cover of an immunisation drive to help confirm bin Laden's whereabouts. Under pressure to meet their targets, vaccinators decide to bypass parental consent. 
There have been reports of vaccinators sneaking into households and vaccinating children when parents are away. If someone into my house without my permission, like you did, I would be upset. Do you think that's okay? Samia Altaf, a public health expert on polio and author of the book So Much Aid, So Little Development, has argued the case that this cycle of mistrust and villainization results from foundational flaws in the organization of the polio program itself. Healthcare projects are often organized according to one of two main models. Vertical systems have a heavy top-down approach, where you have one powerful upper management body that sets out to achieve a single, clearly measurable goal. To deliver on this goal, the organizing body considers what services might be needed, things like surveillance and door-to-door -door delivery, and funds these services for the benefit they can provide. In a wholly vertical system, these services are streamlined to target and address one particular health need. By doing this, the system is more likely to show significant progress in that singular area it was set up to tackle. On the other end of the spectrum, you have horizontal health systems. Here, the focus is on much broader and longer-term health goals, which can only be achieved after balancing success across multiple contributing factors that require their own dedicated services. For example, vaccinating a child isn't likely to develop strong immunity if they're consistently malnourished or lack access to clean water. A horizontally organized project will appreciate the wider needs of a population and integrate its services with local healthcare and its people to provide a more holistic and sustainable health benefit. These projects take much longer to yield significant results, but are arguably more effective in the long run. When multiply deprived populations see coordination with local health providers, and an improvement in their overall quality of life, trust in specific projects like vaccination drives increases. The issue that Dr. Samia highlights as most pertinent to the polio program is the poor flexibility that comes with an overly vertical approach. Pakistan is a place with extremely varied geographies and health challenges. A top-down agenda has meant that on-the-ground workers are unable to tailor their strategies to local issues contributing to the polio problem, making them lose a sense of local ownership. When the emphasis is instead on number of vaccines administered, vaccinators resort to the more aggressive tactics that ultimately make parents feel belittled and judged in the matter of their own child's health. This greatly mars long-term sustainability of vaccination schemes. In March of 2020, as the coronavirus pandemic began to sweep the world, the GPEI Oversight Board issued a statement to suspend its door-to-door -door campaigns and repurpose their assets to aid the fight against COVID-19. While the pandemic caused undeniable disruption to the program, it also saw an increased appetite for an integrated service delivery, which would strengthen response capacity against future infectious diseases. The 20th IMB report, published in summer 2021, describes how Pakistan's polio program has reset itself, with community profiling that helps better understand local health conditions, a commitment to integrated service delivery, and a recalibration of management that empowers provincial leaders rather than controls them. There is a long road ahead. The polio program is on the correct trajectory, but to keep things that way, workers will need to be prepared to identify and address broader health concerns as they arise, rather than caving in to a results-driven approach. To do so would mean ignoring the nuances of complex problems and powering ahead with single-track solutions. 
This reset following the COVID-19 pandemic has given the program another chance to finish the work it started more than 30 years ago. Let's hope it doesn't slip away.